Well, let's open our Bibles to 2 John, shall we? The book of 2 John. Uh, you recall the last time we were together as we began the book, we've divided the book into four very simple sections. The first section deals with truth, verses 1 through 4. The second section deals with love in verses 5 and 6. The third section deals with deceivers. That's verses 7 through 11. And the fourth and final section deals with joy in verses 12 and 13. Now, last time we were together, we not only began the book, but we looked at the first two major sections dealing with truth and love. And we saw that truth and love go hand in hand because according to 1 Peter 1.22, love flows from truth. Because we saw two things about truth. Number one, we looked at what is truth. It's the Word of God, right? John 17, 17, your Word is truth. But we also saw who is truth, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truly love flows from truth. Well, this, of course, brings us to verse 7 and our study for today. So let's pick up our reading in verse 7, and we'll read down through verse 13, the end of of the chapter, 2 John, beginning in verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but... I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. And all God's people say, Amen. Now, as we've mentioned, today we'll be coming to the last two things that John deals with. First, he'll deal with deceivers, verses 7 through 11. And second, he'll deal with joy in verses 12 and 13. Now, for you note takers, you outliners, uh, we're going to look at seven things about deceivers in verses 7 through 11. Seven things. The word deceiver, by the way, planos, used five times in the New Testament, twice right here in verse 7, means to wander, to stray. It carries the idea of leading someone astray or taking someone from the right path, we might say. Now, in the context of dealing with people, it, of course, refers to false teachers, false prophets, false messiahs. We call them deceivers because they lead people astray. Now, of course, there's many things we can mention about deceivers, but we're just going to look at seven of them outlined in our text. So uh, let's take a look at the first thing we learn about deceivers. Number one, they are many. They are many. Look at verse seven again. John says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Question, are there many deceivers in the world today? Oh yes, no doubt about it. There are a plethora of deceivers, those who might have teachings that are like Jesus Christ, but they're not teaching the true Jesus Christ, we might say. Oh, they're deceivers. In fact, in Matthew 24, 5, Jesus said, many will come in my name and say, I am a Christ, and they will deceive Many. In Matthew 24, 11, Jesus said, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Uh, turn back one page to 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 1. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many 
false prophets have gone out into the world. You and I need to test the spirits to make sure, make sure they're not one of the many deceivers that have gone out into the world. In other words, listen gang, don't believe a word anybody tells you, especially me. Don't trust anything anybody says. We need to search the scriptures. We need to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 verse 11. We need to search the scriptures to see whether what anybody is saying is true. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 we are to test all things and to hold fast to that which is good. Question. How do we test all things? Well, it feels right to me. Well, I think it's right. Well, you know, everybody says it's right. It must be. Hey, are you kidding me? What we think or what we feel is oftentimes based on what we eat. Amen? I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if that's God speaking to me, the pepperoni pizza I had last night. Hey, look, it has nothing to do with what we think or what we feel or what we believe. The question is, what does God say? What does God's Word tell us? Because that is the only way we'll, we will not be deceived. You know, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.13 that in these last days, evil men and imposters or deceivers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being Deceived. This is a huge issue to be sure. Back to 2 John, verse 7. Now let's come to the second thing we want to look at regarding deceivers. Number one, they are many. Number two, they deny the incarnation. In other words, they deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and that he will come in the flesh. Look at verse 7 again in 2 John. In verse 7, talking about these deceivers who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. So true deceivers are those who deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh or will come in the flesh. Now there were several different heresies being taught during the first century. Uh, One was docetism. It comes from a root root word, which means to seem. In other words, they taught that Jesus only seemed to be a man, that he only seemed to come in the flesh. They teach that he cast no shadows and left no footprints. So they were deceivers because, yes, while they taught Jesus Christ was 100% God, They said he was not 100% man. And that was one heresy that permeated the early church. Another heresy, of course, was Gnosticism. Now, the Gnostics, from the root word knowledge, uh, they thought they were know-it-alls, we might say. Uh, A secret meaning, a secret knowledge that you and I just couldn't quite grab grab a hold of. The Gnostics believed that everything spiritual was good. But everything physical was bad. So the Gnostics taught that physical things were evil. So they said that Jesus could not have come in the flesh. Because anything fleshly is, of course, evil. Now that flies in the face of Scripture. In fact, we just read in verse 7, it it is the deceivers who don't confess Jesus coming in the flesh. In 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul said, Great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. That God stepped out of eternity into time and took on the additional nature of man, being 100% God and 100% man. In John 1.1, back in the gospel, he says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. And in John 1.14, it says the Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And of his fullness, I can't even say the second part of the verse, it just blesses me so much. You'll have to look it up. <laughs> In, <laughs> okay, it says, and of his fullness we've all received, and grace for grace. Glorious passage. Hebrews 5, 7 talks about the days of his flesh. Same thing in Hebrews 10, 20. It talks about the veil of his flesh. In fact, turn back one page to 1 John chapter 4, if you would, please. Uh, one page to the left. Because if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. You say, Clark, are you sure? Oh, Yes. Look at verse 2 of 1 John chapter 4. Pick it up in verse 2. It says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Wow. Listen, we are either of God or we're not of God. Either we are saved, or we're not saved. Either we're going to heaven, or we're not going to heaven. Based on what? Whether we believe Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. Because the deceivers say he does not and has not come in the flesh. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of deceivers out there today that are pushing that view. You know the Jehovah Witnesses. They teach that Jesus is Michael, the archangel. The Mormons teach that he is the spirit brother of Lucifer. The Church of Christ Science, which is neither a church nor scientific, uh, Mary, Mary Baker Eddy, they teach that Jesus is separate from the Christ, and in his humanity, he simply shows Christ-like ideals. The Church of Scientology with L. Ron Hubbard. Boy, talk about a work of fiction. They say that Jesus was a great teacher, are you ready for this? Who fully realized his own divinity. And you wonder why these religions are so popular. Hey, do you want to realize your own divinity? Do you want to realize the God in you? Oh yes, I want to be a God. <laughs> Follow me? Why? Why do people buy into this deception, lock, stock, and barrel? Well, because if they're God, they can do whatever they want. It's all acceptable. There's no prohibition. Whatever I do is okay because, well, I've realized my own divinity. God help us all. The Unification Church with Sun Young Moon says Jesus was a perfect man, but not God. The Way International says he was not divine, just simply human. The Jews in Judaism say that Jesus was a prophet, but not the Messiah, nor was he God. The Hindus speak of him being a great spiritual guru. Same with the Buddhists. Islam believe he's a, a prophet, but lower than Muhammad. The Baha'i faith he says he's one of God's many incarnations. Some of you have been to Haifa in northern Israel and you see the Baha'i Gardens. It's beautiful. People get sucked into it like crazy. We've toured the Baha'i Gardens. They're beautiful to look at. But boy, the doctrine is so deceptive. Friends, make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ is 100% God in the flesh. He is God Almighty in the flesh. Jesus in John 10.30 says, the Father and I are one. Remember what he told Philip in John 14, 10? He said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Same thing that Thomas proclaimed in John 20, 28. Thomas, looking at Jesus, said, my Lord and my God. He, even Thomas called him God. In Titus 2, 13, it says, we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 9, verse 5, Paul calls Jesus the eternally blessed God. In 1 John 5.20, he's called the true God. 
Every Christmas we get cards with Isaiah 9, 6, right? Isaiah, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Hey, make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ is God. All, in fact, God himself, speaking to the Son in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, says, your throne, O God, is from everlasting to everlasting. That's how eternally important this issue is. Back to 2 John. Well, let's come to the third thing about these deceivers. Is everyone okay? This is heavy stuff. I get it. Let's come to the third thing about deceivers. Number one, they are many. Number two, they deny the incarnation. And number three, they have the spirit of Antichrist. These deceivers have the spirit of of Antichrist. Look at verse 7 again. At the end of verse 7 in 2 John, it says, this is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So the third thing we learn about deceivers, they are of the Antichrist. Now the word Antichrist is only used four times in the entire New Testament, and it is only used by John. It's a compound word, anti, against, or in opposition to. And Christos means anointed, or literally, the anointed one. So an antichrist is one who is in opposition to Jesus Christ and his teachings. Now I'd like you to turn back to 1 John chapter 4 again, if you would, please. 1 John chapter 4, just one page to the left. Because anyone who is against or in opposition to or an adversary of Jesus Christ is an antichrist. Take a look at verse 3. Now, we read the first part of verse 3 in 1 John chapter 4. But let's read the second part of verse 3. Take a look. In the middle of the verse, it says, And this is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now and is now already in the world. Uh, drop back to chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse 18, one more page to the left. Look at 1 John 2, 18. It says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Now, in all four accounts of John using this term antichrist, here in 1 John 2.18, he makes a distinction because there are two antichrists. Notice the first antichrist in verse 18 is capitalized. The King James translators got this one right. It's the proper noun, we might say. Why? Well, because the word the is before it. Now, the definite article becomes pretty significant, not for us. The word the, the definite article in the English language, only particularizes the noun or verb that it's modifying, the house, the car, the Antichrist. But in the Greek language, it emphasizes it. It is the, the one and only Antichrist. And note carefully, class, it says the Antichrist is coming. Now, this particular Antichrist, according to Revelation 11:7, is the beast of the bottomless pit. According to Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, he is the little horn of Daniel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he's the man of sin, the son of perdition. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, he's the lawless one. And this Antichrist, the Antichrist, is coming. You say, okay, Clark, when will he come? Well, we know when he's coming. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, when he that is restraining is removed, the Antichrist will be revealed. Now, no doubt it is pointing to and speaking of the church. We call it the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, when Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God blows and the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. When the church is removed, the, the Antichrist is revealed. And that begins that 70th week of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Also called a period of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. We know it a little better as the seven years of tribulation. So the first Antichrist is the Antichrist who is coming. But note in verse 18, even now many Antichrists have come. And this, of course, is the second Antichrist. This speaks of those who are generally against or in opposition to Jesus Christ. We call them false teachers, false prophets, deceivers from our text. Well, back to 2 John. Let's come to the fourth thing we want to look at. We said there were seven about deceivers. Number four, they could cause others not to receive their reward. Kind of interesting. Take a look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. It says, Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. So we're to be careful not to look to deceivers. Because if we look to these deceivers, these false teachers, it could affect our reward. You say, Clark, what reward are we talking about? Well, that's a good question. In Colossians 2.18, Paul says, let no one cheat you out of your reward. Is it our rewards on earth or our reward in heaven? Yes. (laughs) I mean, I'm not sure. And quite frankly, I don't care because I'm not looking to deceivers. You know what I'm saying? John encourages us in verse 8 to look to yourself. Now, when he says, look to yourself, no doubt, it carries the idea we're to look to our own faith or our own belief in the finished work of Christ on the cross and that he came in the flesh. Because when we do that, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we shall receive a full reward. No doubt there'll be rewards on earth, blessings from God. But there will also be a reward in heaven, a crown for God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, that we are to rejoice greatly, for great will your reward be in heaven. So when we get to heaven, we're going to get a reward, presumably a crown full of jewels. Now for some of you, and we're going to cast it at the glassy sea before the feet of our Lord. Now for some of you, we're going to need a forklift to get that crown off your head. You know what I'm saying? And the rest of us, as we bow down, it'll just, tink, it'll fall off. And you know. (laughs) But the good news is we won't care. Because we're just going to cast it at his feet as we just worship the Lord for all of eternity. You know, this morning we were so blessed, Janet... uh, was here this morning. Ed, I don't know if you guys know Ed and Janet. They've been coming to the barn for over 20 years. Sweet, sweet couple. She always helped in the morning with the donuts in the kitchen before first service. Ed went home to be with the Lord this last week. And uh, he's just a great guy. 93. He made a long time on earth. And he's been around for over 20 years here at the barn and uh, just a wonderful guy. And and I just picture him in heaven right now, just worshiping the Lord. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more headache, no more backache. And uh, (laughs) just casting that crown, you know, before our Lord. Glorious picture. Well, back to 2 John. Let's come to the fifth thing we want to look at. And you might not like this one either. They don't have God. The fifth thing we learn about deceivers, they don't have God. Look at verse 9. 2 John verse 9, it says, whoever transgresses, the word literally means to go beyond, whoever transgresses and does not abide or hold tight in the doctrine or the teaching of Christ does not have God. He who abides or holds on to the doctrine or teachings of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Now this is pretty hard. This is pretty harsh. This is pretty heavy. 
But if we're not abiding in the teachings or doctrine of Christ, we're not of God. And if we're not of God, we're not going to heaven, which means we're not saved. That's how important this issue really is. Well, number six. The sixth thing we learn about deceivers, they are not to be received. They are not to be received. Take a look at verse 10, 2 John verse 10. It says, if anyone comes to you, and does not bring this doctrine, this teaching that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, do not receive him into your house. Wow. People come to our homes all the time who are deceived. And their sole purpose in life is to deceive you. What should we do? The Bible says don't let them in. I mean, for instance, if you got a knock on the door one day and you open it and here is a, some lady with a big black pointy hat, a broomstick and a big wart on her nose holding toads and, and lizards in a bag, would you say, hey, come on in? No, you slam the door. What if you got a knock on the door and you open it and here is some big scraggly guy with a pentagram tattooed on his forehead and big googly eyes with a big sign that says, worship Satan? Would, what would you do? Would you... Hey, come on. No, you would slam the door in his face. Why? Oh, man, he's a, the devil. He's an antichrist. Right. Really doesn't matter how nice people look, how well-groomed they may be, or how wonderful they may smell. We need to be careful. The Bible says not to let them into your house. Ephesians 5, 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Same thing in Romans 16, 17, and 18. You say, but wait a minute, Clark. How in the world can I ever witness to them? Well, it's simple. You take a step outside, you shut the door, and you say, hey, let's walk over to the sidewalk off my property, and we'll talk. Follow me? I don't want anything to do with them. I don't want to be near them or around them. Now, here's the balance. Stay with me on this. When God opens the door of opportunity for you to share with a deceiver, one who is deceived, right on. Step through that door. Share your faith. Share the love of Christ. And if they come around in the days or weeks to come once again to your house and say, you know, I thought about what you said last time we talked and boy, that really struck a nerve in my heart. I want to know more about it. Boy, if you hear those words, say, yeah, come on in. <laughs> Follow me? Come on in, sit down, let me tell you about Jesus. Because now they're seeking truth. There's the difference. Originally, they wanted to deceive you, but now they're seeking truth from you. And I think there's the, the middle ground in our hearts and our lives as believers. Capish? Let's come to the seventh and final thing in this first section. We have to hurry. We only have 45 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> they're not to be greeted. Number seven and finally, they're not to be greeted. Take a look at the end of verse 10. It says, nor greet them. Now, the English word greet that's used here, it might be a little misleading because when we think of greeting somebody, we simply think of saying hi. As we're passing them on a street like, hey, give them a nod or waving or saying hello. To us, that is greeting somebody. However, the, the word that's used, I like how the old King James translated this word, by the way. They say, do not bid them God speed. Yeah. In other words, don't say God bless you. Don't have a dialogue with a deceiver. And at the end of the dialogue say, well, I guess we're just going to have to agree to disagree. So may God bless you. No. Because according to verse 11, it says, he who greets him or says God blesses to him shares in his evil deeds. Wow. So if we're dialoguing with a deceiver, 
at the end of the conversation, don't say, God bless you. Say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God touches your heart. I'm going to pray that God opens your eyes. I pray that the Holy Spirit gets you saved because you're leading down the path of ruin. Follow me? So our English translation here might not be the best, I don't believe, but you understand the point. Well, back to 2 John real quickly. Let's come to the second and final thing we want to look at. We'll wrap this up right here. The first section dealt with deceivers. The second section deals with joy, verses 12 and 13. And if you're taking notes, we would simply mention three things about joy and this lady. Remember back from verse 1, the elect lady. The word lady is uh, kuria, the feminine form of the, of the masculine kurios or master. So presumably she's in charge of the Bible study at her home, we might say. And this kuria, this lady, is who John is referring to. Three things about joy in this lady. Number one, the first thing in, involves imparting truth to her. Imparting truth to her. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink. John had many things to tell her, many truths he wanted to impart to her. He didn't want to do it on paper, and we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But, but I think the point here at the beginning of verse 12 is that, man, John found great joy in imparting truth to others. You know, I find great joy in imparting truth to others. You know, when God opens a door of opportunity with a coworker to share your faith with them, maybe at the grocery store or at school or out and about in the community, when, when God opens that door and you're able to share the love of Christ and the gospel message with somebody, you know the great joy you have in your heart. You know, on Tuesdays, I've been teaching at the Bible College for the last 20 years, and I think they're going to be closing down this next semester, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, uh, because of, you know, they don't want to get all the kids on campus, apparently. But I found, I found great joy in imparting truth, God's word to these young minds, these young men and women that are of the college age. Every Wednesday, every Sunday, at conferences, speaking engagements, all around the, the place when I, when I share Jesus, man, there's just a great joy in imparting truth. Number two, the second thing involves seeing the face of her. Not just imparting truth to her, but seeing the face of her. Uh, look at verse 12 again. In the middle of the verse, John says, I hope to come to you and speak face to face. You know, we all probably feel pretty joyful when we get a phone call from somebody and they're sharing, you know, a, a blessing that God has done in their life. Or when we get an email or a text message from another friend or believer, a word of encouragement or a, 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 a an update on what's going on in their life. And that always brings great joy to our heart. But you know, there's nothing like seeing them face to face. You know, for the last couple of months, I was sitting here in the sanctuary and nobody was here. It was a little creepy. Uh, but I got the letters and the emails and the texts saying, hey, we're watching online. Enjoy the, thanks for just keeping on teaching the Bible study, even though everything's shut down, you know. And, and I felt the connection through the camera, but boy, to see you guys face to face was just, brought, brought great joy to my heart. It just blessed me to no end. I, I think of all our, of all, all our missionaries around the world. Uh, Anthony and Hyacinth, they're in Kochi, India. Uh, Hearing what's going on there was a great blessing, but boy, seeing them face to face, being there in India and, and teaching at his pulpit and having him translate in the local dialect and just being there face to face with the Indian people is just glorious to see the love they have for Jesus Christ. Because you know, in India, there's a lot of weird, wacky religious stuff going on. You know, they have a lot of different weirdness going on. But to see a group of people who hunger for the Lord. Same thing in the Philippines with Pastor Bim there in Hema Island, there at Negros Occidental, one of the islands in the Philippines. Man, to, to be there, to see the work, to see the people so sweet, so humble, so full of love for Jesus, to see them face to face. In Scotland with Pastor Leo and Cheryl Rose. Remember, they were there for many years. Uh, Scotland, a beautiful place, very picturesque, very green, castles, the people. I mean, but boy, talk about being spiritually dark. It is a dark place spiritually. 
But to see the people under Pastor Leo's leadership just turning on for Jesus Christ is amazing. So there is something about seeing it face to face. Well, number three and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. The third and final aspect about joy in this lady is bringing joy to her. Bringing joy to her. Look at verse 12 again. At the end of the verse, it says that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. So John's heart was to bring joy to her. How? Well, by mentioning the lady's sister's children. Now this becomes pretty interesting because back in verse 4, John found great joy to find the lady's children walking in truth. So apparently the inference here is that the lady will find equal joy in knowing that her sister's children are walking in the truth as well. And I think all of us can relate to that. You know, when our children are not walking in the truth, it breaks our heart. When our children are off the deep end, when they're going down the path of destruction, it kills us. But boy, when we see them walking in truth, it brings great joy to our hearts. Man, there's no greater joy. And I am so blessed with my two boys. Man, walking in the truth. They're just good men. Of course, they had a great dad. No, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> it was all their mom. Uh, no doubt it was Sally and the Lord, obviously. But, uh... but here's the picture, family. God is our father. We are his children. And the question for us is pretty simple. <laughs> are we bringing joy to our Father in heaven by walking in the truth. Father, we are so grateful for these few short minutes you've given us. Lord, this opportunity to come together, to study your word. Lord, not that we would simply rise to some kind of intellectual ascent, but that truly, Lord, we would learn more of you, that we might become more like you. And Lord, we recognize that we're not perfect. We all have our faults and flaws. We all blow it day after day, time after time. But Lord, our heart, our desire is just to bring you joy, that we would walk in the truth when we're at work, when we're at home, when we're at school, when we're out and about in the community, when we're on vacation. Lord, wherever we're at, that our life would be lived in such a way that others would see you in us. Let it be so we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors... The brothers, the sisters, they'll all be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, just to serve you and, uh, well, minister to any and every need you might have in your hearts and lives today. And I do pray that as you begin this new week, man, that God would bless you, fill you, encourage you, that he would strengthen your hearts, your hands, guide your feet, that he would provide abundantly for each and every need according to his riches and glory. So God bless you all. I love you so much. Have a great Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers. And uh, don't, yeah, you can give them a hand. Absolutely. And don't forget, you can visit the Salt and Light uh, tent right out on the fellowship lawn. They'll be having prayer after third service. So if you'd like to partake in that, you are all welcome to come. God bless you guys. Have a great week in Jesus.